as Charles said, I'm going to talk about um, deep learning at NERSC. Well, AI at NERSC, and more specifically, deep learning as the the subset of it. So, um, fairly exciting topic. Thanks to the folks that are still here for for sticking around. Um, so yeah, I'm specifically focusing on deep learning and of course, deep learning and AI are, are changing the world. Uh, deep learning is the subset of AI that focuses on, um, uh, deep neural network models. So you can learn, learn from data and solve problems. And uh, of course, um, uh, this deep learning revolution over the last decade has been driven by, uh, things like growing availability of large data sets where deep learning methods, uh, do better than traditional machine learning methods as well as the availability of accelerators like GPUs to, to run the, the compute for training and, and evaluating these models. So in fact, it was just over 10 years ago uh, that you know most people would say the deep learning revolution started when uh, deep learning models started winning competitions. So down here on the uh, lower right is the basically the ImageNet competition. Uh, when GPUs first started to be used there to train deep, deep neural net models and, and win the competition. And then after that, uh, everything, the rest is history. Uh, but AI is transforming science as well across all, all domains, everything that at least we know of. Um, all science domains have data. A lot of them have uh, very large data. Um, so I, um, I think everybody's enthusiastic about trying out techniques. And um, deep learning methodologies are, are flexible and, and um, powerful enough that they can be used in many application areas. So even within a domain, a, a science domain, you might be able to use machine learning in many, many different ways. Uh, some of the key areas where we see folks finding advantages with deep learning methods, uh, they can help you analyze your data um, uh, to get uh, better results. Maybe deep learning models might um, uh, give you uh, more accuracy or, or, or better metrics compared to traditional or heuristic hand-engineered approaches to solving problems. Uh, they might be faster. They might enable you to automate things that otherwise uh, relied on grad students to label images or, or whatever kind of data they have. Uh, so you might be able to you know, analyze your data better or faster. Um, a common theme in the high-performance computing world is um, using AI and deep learning to accelerate expensive physics simulations. So a lot of folks are looking at either replacing a core expensive computational part of a simulation or completely replacing simulations outright with learned generative models. And then there's a smaller set, but also folks uh, looking at AI and deep learning methods for controlling systems or designing complex systems. Uh, the funding agencies are also drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, NSF funds these um, AI research institutes uh, in the DOE space. We've had a bunch of town halls at the national labs uh, and reports, and there's hope that the DOE will fund a large-scale AI for science effort um, in the coming years, something similar to the scale of the Exascale Computing Project. Um, but well, we'll just have to wait and see. There certainly have been a lot of funding calls that come out of the, the DOE side on AI. At NERSC, we do have a growing workload in AI, growing user base, as well as um, um, actual workload running on our systems, especially since we have Perlmutter with GPUs uh, these days. Um, so we, we try to stay informed of what our users are doing in a variety of ways. Uh, we track things, at least traditionally on Cori, we had uh, a bit of instrumentation that is not all fully functional yet on Perlmutter, unfortunately, but we can track the Python packages that people import. If folks would load our modules, like our PyTorch module, we could track how, you know, when that happens and who's doing it. Um, so, you know, we've seen order of magnitude increase over, you know, 2017 to 2021 period of folks using our TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, we also do a survey that we send to our users every couple of years. I think we'll stick to every two year cadence, the ML at NERSC survey. The last one was in 2022. Uh, we ask people a lot of questions, not too many questions. We ask them questions about their machine learning problems, their data sets, the scale that they run at, uh, various challenges. And we use that to inform our support strategy, uh, what things that we're going to prioritize, right? Um, 
in there. Um, of course, we're sending it to NERSC users. Um, not all of them necessarily running their machine learning on our NERSC systems, um, but in the lower left plot, most of them actually, most of them actually are. Uh, I'll have a bunch more plots from the survey to kind of inform things, including this slide, which gives you a little bit more overview of some of the things we ask and some of the things we learn from that. So on the upper left, we see people are coming from all kinds of science domains. Um, in the lower left, we see we, we ask about the maturity of their research. Uh, we also ask about their experience. And, and basically what I want to just call out here is um, we have seen a trend towards more maturity in machine learning workflows. So people are actually starting to put things in production for science. Uh, um, but the spectrum is still very broad. There's still a lot of people that are just getting started with it um, or, or you know, various stages of maturity. On the upper right, we see most people are using machine learning for offline data analysis. Um, but this year we actually had quite a lot of responses on people uh, trying to use machine learning in their simulation workflows, which is pretty cool. And then on the lower right, you see the kinds of tasks people are doing. So regression, classification, um, and then others. So uh, these days, deep learning is very much a high performance computing problem, uh, especially when we look at training models. And that's because the cost of training models has been growing over time as people use larger models on larger data sets and harder problems. The plot on the upper right is from OpenAI uh, that shows the cost of computing popular um, machine learning model tooling all the way back to 1960. And you see the deep learning era on the right where um, there's a sharp increase in this exponential growth of cost of compute. Uh, but that doesn't even include the large language model um, explosion in the last couple of years. So I added the plot on the lower right just to show you just the deep learning era. We also have another very sharp increase when we start to um, uh, include the transformer architectures for, for language modeling. These are the ones that you probably hear about so much in the, in the media. Uh, yeah, so these take a very, 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 uh, these take a lot of compute to train these models. Um, so you need a lot of um, GPUs, you need a lot of resources in order to um, have a reasonable time to train and a reasonable time to discovery and to do rapid iteration, which is needed for research. Uh, we also ask our users questions about the scale of their problem. And while a lot of our users have moderately scaled uh, machine learning problems, uh, we do see a growing tail where folks, if training on a single device, may have to wait weeks to months. They have terabytes, maybe more of data, and they can actually use large scale resources in the training of their models. So hundreds, maybe even thousands of GPUs and various forms of parallelism. Um, I don't have a lot of detail here, introductory stuff on parallelizing deep learning. I will refer you later to a tutorial that we do at Supercomputing, including one that's coming up um, this year in November, where we'll expand a bit on model parallelism. So I just have one slide giving an overview on how people parallelize deep learning today. Um, and this doesn't really cover everything, but it sort of um, uh, uh, captures the you know the most common the most common things that people are doing. So data parallelism on the left is the most common way people parallelize deep learning training today. This is where you replicate your model across many processors and you partition the data. So you're parallelizing in the data axis. Uh, when we're training models with stochastic gradient descent, we're sampling batches of data for each optimization step. So what we're doing here is we're essentially partitioning each of those batches across many GPUs on Perlmutter. And then we have collective um, communication synchronization steps in between to, uh, to aggregate things and make sure every Every processor's model stays in sync throughout the whole training. So that's the most common, but there's also various forms of model parallelism where instead of partitioning in the data space, we're actually partitioning the model, either in terms of the parameters or its operations or both. Um, and so um, two typical ways to do this here are tensor parallelism in the middle where we can take maybe each layer of a neural network and it split that up. So split the matrix multiplications of a layer across many GPUs. And then on the right is layer pipelining, where we might take different layers of a neural network and put them on different GPUs. And then we have data flowing uh, between them. So um, model parallelism is great when you have models that don't fit on a single device. Uh, you can maybe sometimes get speed ups by doing model parallelism, but um, it, it depends because you introduce quite a bit more communication overhead from the data that's flowing from GPU to GPU. 
Um, so data parallelism, again, is the most common, uh, but there are limits to its effectiveness. So you can generally scale up to, you know, tens or hundreds of GPUs maybe, um, but you're effectively growing your global batch size as you're training this at larger and larger scale, uh, which has impacts on learning. And so you might have to tune hyperparameters and above a certain scale, you may not get any more benefits. Um, there are results that combine various forms of these parallelism. So I linked to one down here uh, from NVIDIA and Microsoft, a collaboration which is already actually two years ago. Uh, but there's a large language model where they used tensor parallelism within a node, so eight GPUs on a node. They used layer pipelining across uh, tens of nodes, I forget the exact number, and then data parallelism on top of that to use thousands of GPUs. So check that out. I think I'll just mostly skip this. Uh, basically, our strategy for supporting AI, we try to deploy advanced systems and software, but we also work with methods and applications, and then we do a lot of training as well like this. Um, so now getting into uh, some of the details of the actual uh, software on Perlmutter and how you can use it. Uh, so starting with an overview, our general strategy here is to provide, we build and provide um, uh, performant installations of what people are mostly using, the most popular frameworks and libraries, uh, and then also try to enable flexibility for users to do whatever they want, because a lot of users want to uh, have their own Conda environments, their own containers, um, customize things to whatever extent they want. <clears throat> so, um, that basically boils down to us. We, we, we give prioritized support for things like TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, so we have dedicated modules for those, which I'll mention again in a second. Um, uh, we have a little bit of support for JAX these days, but we don't have a module for it. We do have some documentation um, because there has been an uptick. We noticed it in, in users uh, asking for help with, with tickets uh, related to JAX. Um, so that's also somewhat covered here. Um, in terms of distributed training libraries, I'll, I'll come back to this, but we um, we build and provide Horovod or um, PyTorch distributed with Nickel and MPI to make sure these things run efficiently on our systems. Uh, this is not so much part of my responsibility or the AI team's responsibility, but we work with the rest of NERSC to ensure that uh, AI users can use Jupyter and Shifter and things like that, other kinds of productive tools and services that enhance their experience. <clears throat> So how do you use the deep learning software stack on Perlmutter? So for the modules, uh, we have TensorFlow and PyTorch modules. You can just type module load PyTorch and, and you're good to go. These are actually complete Python environments. So you don't have to do module load Python and then module load PyTorch. You can just type module load PyTorch. And this is an environment that we've built that has PyTorch as well as a bunch of other packages that are most commonly used. So things like PyTorch Geometric, uh, PyTorch Lightning, uh, Ray. Um, if there's something that you need and you think a lot of other users might need that's not currently there, you can always ask us. And um, as long as it's reasonable to add, I, I usually try to add it. You can check which versions are available. You can do module avail or module spider to do that. Um, we have various ways to customize these. So one is that you can do module load PyTorch and then install packages on top of that with this pip install user command here. Uh, that works because we set the Python user base environment variable using the module name and version. So it's unique to that module. And every time you load that module, uh, again, in the future, uh, you will still have your user install packages available. Um, there can be some pitfalls to using pip install user. We don't recommend you overuse it. Just kind of be careful with it. Sometimes you might accidentally over um, override a package, like you might accidentally install a different PyTorch than what was in the module. This can cause issues. So just, just be careful with it and ask for help if you need help. Um, our module environments are actually clonable with Conda. So you can point to where the PyTorch module installation is and you can clone that as a Conda environment and then you can add whatever packages you want. Um, and of course, also you can just roll your own Conda environments, um, but you may not have all the features that we put in our modules to efficiently run on the systems. And please refer to the documentation pages for more of the details, or I'm happy to answer questions when we're done. We increasingly recommend that people use containers. Uh, you, you probably picked up on this more broadly in some of the previous talks that containers have very nice features for 
for our systems, including um, scalability of startup. I think Lisa mentioned that for uh, startup times related to file systems. Um, today, we actually have a couple options of, of running containers on Perlmutter. So Shifter is the standard, like one that's in production and it's stable and easy to use. Uh, there's a lot of work in but being invested on, on Podman. Um, for the AI stuff, we still recommend that people stick to Shifter for now. There are still some quirks using Podman. Depending on what you're doing, it might work fine, but um, that should be coming coming soon. So, um, But Shifter is performance. In fact, our top 500 entry for Perlmutter used a container. Uh, we have a lot of containers already for PyTorch and TensorFlow available on Perlmutter. You can check what's there with this shifter image command. Um, if you can you can pull an image if you want from Docker Hub with the pull command. Uh, you can start up an interactive um, terminal to play with a container, or you can run in a bash script. And if you do that, uh, we recommend using these sbatch uh, things here in your script to specify the image, as well as these shifter modules that um, uh, allow you to run uh, efficiently on the slingshot network. So particularly this nickel shifter module here is important. That's a relatively new thing this year. Uh, so if you're going to run with containers on Perlmutter, uh, then we really recommend that you use containers provided by NVIDIA or based on containers provided by NVIDIA. Because NVIDIA provides their NGC uh, container images, so NVIDIA GPU cloud containers. They put them out every month, so there's a lot of them, and they always have the latest versions of the NVIDIA CUDA software stack. So it um, should be the best for performance. They have uh, TensorFlow images with Horvod, PyTorch images with everything you need there. Um, we we already pull a lot of those onto Perlmutter, so uh, chances are what you need might already be there. And we have NERSC images as well that are based on the NVIDIA ones, which are similar to our modules where we also install uh, popular packages that users might want. Um, besides that, you can always build your own containers. Although with Shifter today, it's a little cumbersome. You have to build a container with Docker somewhere like on your laptop, push it to um, either Docker Hub or the NERSC registry, and then pull on Perlmutter in Shifter. Uh, when Podman is fully ready to go for machine learning, that will enable you to build your own containers uh, on Perlmutter. Um, so uh, that'll be a nice capability. And then there's some notes here on the bottom about customization, which you can just kind of read on your own. Or, or open MPI. Actually, the NGC containers tend to have open MPI, whereas on Perlmutter we have Cray and Pitch. So just uh, know that there there can be some um, specific things to to know if you're if you're going to run that. Okay, and just in terms of distributed training, uh, this is our set of recommendations or or, or packages that we um, uh, recommend. So actually most people these days are using the framework built-in libraries for distributed training. Um, thankfully, these have come a long way. It's not always been the case that um, just using what was in PyTorch or just in TensorFlow was, uh, was easy and, 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 um, and good for deploying on a supercomputer. But um, these days uh, it's actually pretty good. So PyTorch distributed data parallel is kind of the most recommended way to do distributed uh, data parallel training with PyTorch. It's a very convenient wrapper. You wrap around your model and there's a little bit of an extra setup. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but again, it's in a, a tutorial that I'll link shortly. TensorFlow has their distribution strategies, which you can look at. Although for TensorFlow, I, I do think it's still easier these days to use Horovod on Perlmutter. So we definitely recommend uh, Horovod. And there's some examples here. Uh, a lot of users use PyTorch Lightning or DeepSpeed or Ray. Um, so these should be available in our uh, in our environments, and they have various features. Deep Speed, for example, has these zero optimizations, um, which basically have ways of um, reducing copies of states and optimizers, partitioning them across your devices to reduce memory, or doing offload onto CPU for certain things. So um, if you're having trouble fitting your device in a single GPU um, in a distributed setting, some of these may, may help you there without having to resort to model parallelism. But DeepSpeed also has various forms of model parallelism there that you can use. Uh, Ray has some built-in distributed training stuff. I think it's basically the same as, as DDP, but um, the nice thing about that is there's a nice integration with high performance, or sorry, a hyperparameter optimization. Uh, LBAN is a package out of Livermore, which is basically, you know, 
hybrid parallel deep learning targeting HPC systems. So you can check that out if you're interested. Uh, for communication backends, because we have NVIDIA GPUs, Nickel is the backend of choice. It's going to get you the most performance. Um, but when we upgraded Perlmutter to Slingshot um, 11 with LibFabric, um, uh, Nickel didn't work immediately out of the box, but we worked with NVIDIA and HPE to port a plugin that comes from AWS that enables Nickel to run RDMA over the, uh, the Slingshot network. We have some stuff in our docs about how to use it. If you do module load PyTorch, you get it automatically. If you use our shifter Nickel module, you get it automatically. All right, a little more general guidelines for running deep learning at NERSC. Uh, I think I've linked our documentation multiple times. Oh, that actually the URL might not be right. I don't know if it'll work. It doesn't work. Sorry, I'll have to fix that because we moved the um, we moved the location. But um, I think it's on other slides too. Um, yeah, machine learning docs. Go to those for uh, hopefully all the best information. Uh, we recommend you use our provided software if appropriate. Uh, it's not necessarily appropriate for everybody, but um, it should have the right builds, the right features that uh, that run appropriately on our on our systems. So Hor Horovod, for example, will be built to use Cray and Pitch on our system. Right. Um, if you're doing some R and D work, uh, there are a lot of features you probably already know about at Nurse that can be helpful. You can use the interactive QoS. You can use Jupyter. You can ask for a single GPU now on Jupyter, which is great for um, um, developing things. Um, you can use TensorBoard or Weights and Biases to, to visualize your models and results. I think I have slides on those in a minute. For performance tuning, we do recommend you not neglect uh, GPU performance. Uh, it's easy to just say, well, this is slow, so I'm just going to throw tens or hundreds of GPUs at the problem to try and speed it up. Uh, a lot of times you can get a lot more out of your GPU allocation on Perlmutter by doing a little bit of uh, optimization work there. So definitely check your utilization first. You can just run NVIDIA SMI while your workload is running to see um, how well you're utilizing GPUs. Data pipelines are the most common source of bottlenecks. Uh, we see that all the time. So definitely use what's recommended in, in terms of the frameworks. Um, try to use parallelism and data loading. Uh, we have more details on, on how to do these things and how to optimize performance in our tutorial. Um, you can also run profilers like NVIDIA Insight Systems or TensorBoard Profiler. All right, a little bit more on workflow tools. So Jupyter, um, I'm sure you've heard about it. It's a really popular service at, at NERSC and uh, machine learning users really like it. Of course, all NERSC users really like it. Um, it's a great way to develop your machine learning code. Uh, we do have kernels that you can just click and start a notebook right away with um, that, that correspond to our modules. So there is, you know, PyTorch kernel in Jupyter. You can just click and that should give you the same environment as the corresponding PyTorch module on Perlmutter. Okay, uh, and then you can also build your own kernels and there's a link to the documentation to show you how to do that. Uh, TensorBoard is a nice way to visualize results of training to um, do some inspection of your model to, to track experiments like loss as you're training or to look at examples, a lot of visualization capabilities. And um, we have a little helper utility here, this NERSC TensorBoard helper that just lets you start it very easily from Jupyter. So you can um, log to TensorBoard at NERSC, uh, start up a Jupyter session, put this into a notebook, and basically it'll, it'll open up a tab where you'll have TensorBoard uh, running. So um, that's convenient, I think, for quite a few people. And there's some links here to show you how to set it up. Uh, that This TensorBoard helper is included in the um, kernels that we deploy already, though. Um, okay, but it's not just all about training models. Uh, uh, everybody basically has to do hyperparameter tuning as well. So model selection and tuning are critical for getting the most out of deep learning. Uh, there are a lot of libraries out there to help you with this. Um, and uh, this kind of problem where you're training many different models to figure out which one's the best is uh, even more computationally expensive than training, obviously. Um, but that makes it a good fit for HPC resources. So uh, it's the kind of thing where if you really need all of Perlmutter, it, it might be for something like this. Um, our users like a lot of different kinds of tools, um, Keras Tuner, Weights and Biases, RayTune, things like that. Um, 
for the most part, I think people can can run whatever they want on Perlmutter, and we're happy to help with any issues that you might have. Um, we do have some helpers or examples for things like weights and biases. This is a relatively new thing from my colleague Shashank. So this weights and biases template, it's, it's basically a template repository, which should set you up with the distributed training and um, ability to do hyperparameter optimization with weights and biases. Um, one of our postdocs, Andrew Naylor put together this Ray cluster helper tool, which actually allows you to do this kind of stuff even in a Jupyter notebook. So it, it has some, some stuff to help spin up a Ray cluster if you're going to do something like Raytune. Um, yeah, ask us for help if you need help. And I'm almost at the end here. So on the outreach side, we do a lot of training. We do a lot of um, events like uh, we've done a deep learning for science school a while back. So actually it's getting a little bit old now, but 2019 and 2020. In 2019, we had an in-person week-long event uh, with lectures, hands-on yeah, yeah. sessions. Is there a question? Then no, okay. Um, you can find the videos and slides on the web page for that. And then in 2020, because of the pandemic, we moved to a weekly webinar series. Again, all the material is available online. There's a lot of introductory stuff on deep learning. There are talks and concepts relative to deep learning applied to science and, again, hands-on things. Uh, we do a deep learning at scale tutorial, which I've hinted at earlier. Um, we, we run this at conferences like Supercomputing. Uh, we're doing it again this year at Supercomputing. If you're going to be there, check it out. Um, we have lectures and hands-on material that cover basically distributed training concepts, scaling, profiling, and optimization. And the hands-on portion will be done on Perlmutter this year. Uh, but you can see all the material from last year. So we have all the slides and the code at this link. There's a GitHub repository. Um, which should be really helpful to you if you just want to learn how do I speed up this uh, this training pipeline. Okay, and this year at SE23, we're going to actually have quite a bit more of a focus on model parallelism, so some new problems and um, new exciting techniques. Um, NVIDIA has put on uh, an AI for Science Bootcamp last year, and they're doing one again this year in October. Um, that's going to cover things like uh, there's some, some stuff on physics-informed neural networks. So um, I think you can still apply if you're interested. And of course, we have regular data seminars. Uh, that just brings me to the conclusion. So um, deep learning for science is it's an exciting time, I think, for science. It's, uh, it's here. It's growing. Everybody's looking at it has really powerful capabilities and um, we're doing our best to make sure things run well on HPC. Perlmutter definitely has a performance software stack for it. Um, we're trying to do our best to support uh, everything you might need for your workflows, um, but please let us know if you have any feedback, if there's anything else you'd like to see us doing, um, any things that are particularly difficult for you, feel free to uh, open a ticket or just reach out. There's also the NERSC user Slack where people can ask about machine learning things. There's a machine learning channel on there. Um, sorry, there's a link to the ML at NERSC survey. That must be the old one. I, I'll watch for our survey next year when we'll do it again. That's all. Thank you.